clap for you. Does that work? Brilliant. Hey guys, welcome to the Fundamentalists Podcast. My name is L.A. Morgan and I'm here with Dr. Peter Rollins. We have a very special episode for you today. Uh, if you are a longtime listener, you know this is a podcast where uh, myself, an uh, internet and stand-up comedian, discusses big, heavy life slash philosophical issues with a living, actual philosopher named Dr. Peter Rollins who's written all sorts of fun <laughs> books. Like you're using doctor a lot. Doc, yeah. ex- absolutely. I'm really trying to legitimize it as yeah. much as possible because today we're talking about socialism. Uh, and Which is what, your choice. My choice, yes. So we've been yeah. going back and forth on the topics of discussion, uh, and I'm choosing this week. Um, something light. Something, something non-controversial. light. controversial That no one, yeah, that everyone agrees something on. Something that's not polarizing, because that's what we need at the moment. Exactly. Something that is not polarizing. And nothing yeah. is these days, yeah. So basically, here's the deal. We're going to talk about socialism. I have a loose, the loosest possible idea of what socialism is. What I have noticed, however, is that I might still have a better idea uh, than maybe a bunch of other people. And also, Pete here has actually read uh, Karl Marx, and he's actually <laughs> aware of this type of stuff. We yeah. are also, just to, some, uh, just to throw out some more disclaimers, not trying to convert anyone here. Uh, we're not protesting about socialism. We're not trying to take to the streets about this particular issue. We just want to kind of discuss it and uh, see if we can wrap our heads around it. And so if you or someone you know doesn't understand anything about socialism, this might be of help to them, or it might not. Well, I don't know. We're going to see what happens together. Um, but just know we are on your side. We like you. We're not yeah, trying whatever to... Whatever you believe, uh, we believe We believe thing. it, too. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, we're cool and agreeable. Yeah. Um, but we are headed towards certain dooms. So, Pete... So uh, it, almost, it almost sounds like you're slightly nervous because people get in trouble online if they say the wrong thing. Exactly. It's weird. It's crazy. It's a crazy thing. It's a crazy thing. And so also like, yeah, I'll talk to a Marxist about socialism. I'm crazy like that. Except <laughs> you, Pete, are not like a... Um, like a anti democracy anarchist kind of guy. No. You in fact when we hang out privately when the cameras and microphones aren't recording, we have all sorts of discussions in which I feel like I'm the more liberal one and Pete is the more conservative oh, one. Yes, only because absolutely. you seem to have a heart and a brain where you can connect and see people for their value and not just their political identification. But that's beside the point. Pete Let's dive in. What do you say? Okay, let's do it. And, and oh, and <laughs> in celebration, just so you guys know, of uh-huh. this discussion about socialism, we are the putting, new currency. I want to show you the new currency that we have here. This is a one hundred dollar bill with Trump's face on it, yeah. um, and it's gold. And it says the uh, the date on it is July fourth, seventeen seventy six, which is his birthday, and. Uh, 17, 17, 17. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I was thinking, seven, I'm 73. I'm like, yeah. I don't know about you, but I don't feel like America was born until uh, Donald Trump became mm. president. And he's a hero. So, but he, he's been saying, and I trust him, uh, he's been saying that this Joe Biden guy is a big socialist, that wow. we need to save America from socialism. Yeah. And Joe Biden has said, oh, no, no, that's not me. Yeah. I think that's interesting. Yes. So you saying Joe Biden is kind of distancing himself from social media. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, it'd be yeah, cooler yeah, yeah. if he didn't. If I'm, yeah. if I'm, I mean, it'd be more entertaining. Yeah. I mean, I have got to say, the people who don't like socialism and the people who do like socialism in America, the vast majority of them, I don't think they know what socialism is. On the one thing sides. they can agree on <laughs> is that they are unhappy. They're unhappy, yeah. But I, yeah, I, you know, because I'm from Europe and... Humble as part brand. of my education, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, in philosophy, you read Marx, of course. Yeah. So, like Marx is and actually, I was I was taught by a very prominent Marxist uh, guy uh, in Ireland called James Daly, who was an activist and a theorist and a very interesting guy. So, uh, you know, so I, you should be a raging socialist. Yes. Yet. Uh-huh. Well, you I'm, are very sympathetic toward the right for good reason. I'm very, oh yeah, I'm very, I'm very critical of the so-called I'm going to say the so-called left because I don't think they're leftists. I think the majority of the people who call themselves leftists aren't strictly speaking leftists. Yeah, the the, the differentiation is the liberal and leftist, right? Yeah. And so I, that's just a distinction I make, but they're thrown in together. Yeah. Often. So so you'll get, for example. You'll get, uh, you know, people asking for representation within the system, yes. right? So that is not obviously 
Marxist, right? If you, um, you'll get uh, people who want co full communism straight away, um, which is kind of not socialism. I mean, we should probably get into what socialism is and communism is. We're getting is. ahead of ourselves. I know yeah. I dove into the oh, deep end. That's good. Even... I mean, that, we should bounce around because it's not yeah. a lecture and it shouldn't it's be a not lecture. not a lecture. We're not. I'm just, yeah, we're, we're, I'm, I'm all yeah. firing on all cylinders right now. But you now. know what? The funny thing is as well, Marx said virtually nothing about socialism. Right, and virtually Isn't nothing about communism. And everything he wrote, there is a few pages on communism and socialism. So, so Marx wrote n very little about these things. But when you say his name, you immediately think communism and socialism. Yeah, I mean, he he basically the, terrible at branding. Yes, <laughs> the vast majority of his work was an analysis of capitalism. That's the vast. So, capitalism itself, that's capital, is an analysis of capitalism and an analysis of its contradictions and socialism and communism are basically well okay can i say i'll start with this please this is an easy place to start broadly marx thought that there was let's say broadly speaking seven modes of production right which and a mode of production is a way that a society creates and distributes commodities okay right it's already interesting yeah no <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um they are pretty much right there's what's called the asiatic mode we can forget about that for a second. But there's slavery, feudalism, capitalism, then socialism and communism. So Is what, that a scale? It's kind of a scale. It's kind of a scale of what, what how society moves through. Asiatic isn't at the beginning. Asiatic is something that's a little bit outside. So the ones that we know are the slave mode of production, feudalistic mode of production. What's feudalistic? I hear that word constantly. What does that mean? That's Before just, we even dive into the capitalism, socialism, and communism definitions, what oh, is feudalism? Yeah. That, I mean, that's just where you've got the lords, you've got yeah, the you ladies, you've got the that. what's that? The caste system. The caste system, like, you know, yeah, where you give a certain into, amount. You're born, yeah, you're born into it. Absolutely, you're born I mean, into it. The chain of being, you're stuck where you are. It's because God or nature wants it. You give a certain percentage to the feudal lords, and they might protect you or whatever. And then the rest is in the market. So there is a free market in feudalism. Like you go with your chickens and your grain mm -hmm. into the market, but you give a certain amount to the right. feudal lords. You go with your grains and your chicken into the market, but you're not going to sell enough chickens that you're going to become a lord. No. Yeah, yeah. You're never going to get there. Whereas capitalism How many chickens does it take there. to be a lord? <laughs> yeah, whereas capitalism has the possibility or at least the illusion that, you know, you can kind yes. of move. The illusion. So, yeah. so okay, yeah. so we have feudalism, and then from that is it's capitalism. capitalism. And so one, the first claim of Marx or th that we can look at is a very simple one, which is simply that some people, and they're called capitalist realists, this is called capitalist realism, is that capitalism is the end of history, right? The, the, the last socioeconomic uh, mode of production is capitalism. There is nothing beyond it, right? So that's capitalist realism. Marx is saying, well, no, it's an historical thing, and there will be other modes of production after capitalism. Capitalism is a body that will eventually die, like every body dies, and something will replace it. And socialism is the next mode of production, and then communism is the next mode of production. And for Marx, and this is where I think he was wrong, is communism is the, f is the final mode of production. What do you think is the final mode of production? I don't think there is a final mode. I think there is... There is no utopic end. collapse and start over basically. yes <laughs> um yeah the great the great circle of life um also what i've heard so how would you right. define socialism socialism okay so not capitalism not socialism. capitalism and then okay. we'll get into to socialism i think because it's harder what i found and i think this is what's interesting is yeah uh it's harder to define socialism without including capitalism in the conversation yeah and okay can i then say three things that distinguish socialism from capitalism i'd love if you did right and if you want to start with you know no this no, no this is good i'm okay. looking at, i want to go away. we're just going to chat we're having see a what i mean how great is this i mean this is so perfect we're not yeah. offending anybody yet yeah that's it we're just trying to define terms and so if i put down like say three things that are about socialism and capitalism yeah. the first two i kind of reject about socialism but i'll put it so the first one is right a capitalist system predominantly has private individuals who own the companies that create and distribute yes. commodities, right? So capitalist system, you have private individuals, they own the, the means of production. I well. am a business owner I'm a business, yeah. of Valley Folk Incorporated. You are. You Therefore, are the petty bourgeois. I am the bourgeois. Yes. I have an employee. You are the oppressor. Uh, you are the, yeah. Oh, I'm for sure the oppressor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I then 
my workers. One and two is that one what and you call one them? now. What? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's a tough economy for some reason. Uh, he works for a set amount of money, right? Yeah. He produces such incredible videos. Yeah. They are worth more than the, the value that yeah. he creates. Um, but you don't tell him that. You just put him down. He constantly. knows, but I don't tell him. No, yeah, no, don't tell him. Everyone else tells him. <laughs> uh, he's a genius, so he, you know, whatever. Uh, he does make your stuff look good, and I know your stuff isn't good. So yeah, it, and he he's does also a good job. he is also as of the past year a bit more. He's a partner in the ah. whole thing, so I'll just throw Ooh, that. Well, that's out. more of a cooperative. That's good. Anyway, keep going. Well, we're you know yeah. we're a little liberal uh, snowflakes. Ah, so <laughs> pause for drink, um, yeah. and then. Uh, so then he produces something that's of higher value than w- what we're paying him for. Yeah. When yeah. that profit goes in, theoretically, I would take that profit. Yeah. Most of it, I, though, am, I'm assuming the risk. So, well, are you? That's interesting because you go like, yeah, you're assuming risk, but whose job is first on the line when things go wrong? Yours or his? But whose paycheck is first on the line when things go wrong? Is it not like if things go bad, do you not get rid of, as you did, potentially got rid of somebody? If you want your business to keep going, you could take a pay cut. Uh, the owner would take a pay cut. Yeah. And then, then, but you're right, I'm still keeping my job. Yeah. If but, things but, get really yeah. bad, then the whole business shuts down. And then but, I, walk with the, I walk with all the money. Yeah. But you all know the what? Money. That, that's, the, that's the level that most of these debates happen on. And that's not what Marx is talking about. Okay. This, actually, you're getting to the core. So I'm, getting, I'm making it individualistic. Well, no, well, what, what you're hitting on is Marx's key, his key insight about capitalism, which is this. So, or should I finish the three points first? No, let's just go into this and then we'll go back to the three mm-hmm. points. Is that, so Marx is, Marx is a Hegelian, right? Hegelian philosopher. He's the, he's the main guy. I'm a Hegelian. So I'm a big fan of right. him. So Marx comes out of Hegel. Hegel's entire work. I myself am a Romulan. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little Star Trek. Yeah, <laughs> nice. I like it. Um, he and you know what? Hegel has a language as weird as the Romulan language. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, you have to learn Romulan even... or um, what's the one that uh, what's the other one? There's Romulan, and then there's the ones with the foreheads. Oh, the Vulcan? No, not no. Vulcan. Um, it's the one that. Uh, oh. Uh, People will know what I'm talking about. This isn't yeah. what that podcast. This is, this by the is, way, this is Steve would be turning his grave right now. Look at us. I don't know if Steve's did. a big Star Trek fan. I might be a bigger Trekkie. Oh, is that right? Steve. And I'm, you don't yeah, know who the guys with on, the big foreheads are. Yeah, uh, it's not wrong. Maybe no, it's not wrong. Anyway, we'll yeah. we'll get into a set. But we are. It loops in because we are headed toward a Star Trek, uh, you know, utopia very soon. Yes, which is what this is related to. Anyway, yeah. you're a Hegelian, yeah. which no one understands what that means, and that's fine. And in a nutshell, kind of what he did is Hegel said that. Life moves forward through contradiction. There's a problem arises. We try to solve the problem. As we kind of get deeper into the problem, we kind of solve it, but we solve it by finding a deeper problem. So all Marx did is he took Hegel's philosophy and he applied it to economy. He says, economies move forward through contradictions and deadlocks. And so a problem happens within the slave mode of production and its solution is feudalism. And then feudalism generates problems, and the solution is capitalism. Yeah. And you float like a butterfly, you sting like a socialist. Yeah. You float like a capitalist, you sting like a socialist. That's nice. Yeah, then you float. <laughs> um, so, like, the problem in, in, in slavery is, of course, there's just this, pr- this utter violence that's very obvious, and eventually slaves are going to revolt. You can't they also- own humans. Say it again? humans have a funny way of not wanting to be owned. Yes, exactly. And also within a slave society, the slaves have all the skills. They are creating. They are, you know, they're yeah, the creators the craftsmen, of things. They're yeah. The, yeah. So they, they have like a lot of the skills and, and including, um, Nietzsche talks about this, that, that the, the, when you have no weapons, the only weapon you have is your mind. So you can generate abstract thought and argumentation. So slaves become stronger and eventually the system wow corrupts and blows up, enters into feudalism. Feudalism brings in ideology, brings in, you know, the gods want you, you are to worth be... this. You were born into this. Yep, you have exactly. been, you're destined to be this for the rest of your life. Yes. So find happiness in it and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. But then that oppression gets too much. They enter into capitalism. And here's the thing with capitalism is capitalism. Technically everyone is equal under the law. Everyone is, 
uh, you know, technically, not in reality, but when capitalism is working at its best, is what? Theoretically. Theoretically, everyone's equal. everyone's equal under the law. Free market, you go in, you sell commodities. And Marx says something fascinating. He says that basically, right, every commodity finds its value. Right. When you go into the market and no one's compelling you to sell on eBay or whatever, right? You eventually you work out what the value is, everyone trades, everything gets its value, every commodity, right? Except one. In capitalism, one magical commodity enters into the marketplace that never gets its value. One commodity that is always undervalued when the system is working well. And that commodity, which you mentioned, is labor. I was going to say time, but I guess, um, okay, yeah, that's the same Yeah, labor. Idea. So if I come into the marketplace, you only, you buy my labor for $50 a day because it's worth $100 a day to you. And now Marx isn't making a moral claim or anything. He is just saying that what happens is the market has this weird commodity in it, and most people, that's the only commodity they have to sell, their labor power. So there's this weird commodity in the market where you are always not getting the value of it. And this is ultimately what causes market crashes and hyperinflations. And is this and kind everything. of what people talk about when you hear kind of the socialist, um, I don't want to say propaganda, but like the socialist tropes of, you know, you buy a sweater and that market has decided that the sweater is worth that amount. But you're not thinking about the cotton. You're not thinking about the effort, at the machine that built it, who built the machine, who bought the machine. Who, well, not maybe you think about who bought the machine, but who invented it, who uh, transported it, who put it on the rack, who checked it out for oh, you. Yeah. Like it's any object you buy is, I guess, imbibed with so much more work than you're paying yeah. for it. Well, this is why, I mean, Marx basically said that a commodity is like a theological thing because when we encounter a commodity like this alcohol I'm drinking right now, it's magical. It's like it's just arrived. It's just there. I took it out of my fridge and I poured it. It's, and it's yours. Yeah. It's completely divorced from... You bought it, so you own it. I own it. And I don't know all of the things that have happened. So a commodities no. are like these magical things that just are like, they glue, you know, these beautiful bottles. and It's weird. Yeah. But it's really the, weird. But behind it is a whole, you know, chain of events, including lots of nasty events. A whole cause and effect that is like goes back mm -hmm. in so many different directions you could never possibly. Yeah. But who cares? Yeah. Why care? I care. Truly, yeah. like, yeah. why? Why? Why would I care mm -hmm. that uh, a sweater came from somewhere? Like, it it got the whoever was doing it did it on purpose. Am I supposed to be as the capitalist feeling bad for that? Yeah. Well, yes, and that, and that's the thing, right? Marx is not primarily in his earlier work. He's more of a, he does have these moral dimensions, but in his later work, he's he's being he's being as scientific as possible. So he doesn't want to say capitalism is moral or immoral. You can talk about that, and he has views on that. He thinks it cr creates alienation. And in his early work, which I think is very, very good, one of the things he, the issues he has is that working for somebody else, making something that you have no real investment in, is actually alienating. It, it's something that's destructive to your soul. But in his later work, he's not, he's not building his argument on that. He's just saying that that surplus value is made Right, workers go in, they sell their labor, someone gets the surplus value, and then the, the managers, they want to lower the cost to make more profit. This means that workers can't buy the goods. That means you've got a, too many goods and not enough people buying them. Then banks have to come in to give loans to get poor people to be able to buy stuff. And it all just causes all of these problems. And Marx is basically saying that, that eventually this is going to get too much. The system will collapse from within and something else will arise. So he basically thinks capitalism is like a body, right? A lot of bodies are killed by gunshots or whatever, but most of bodies are destroyed internally by themselves. They just run out of they run energy. Out, they run out of energy. So Marx is basically saying, well, eventually capitalism will auto-deconstruct. It, it will collapse from within, even if it doesn't collapse from without. And what will happen is something else needs to arise. And you know what it is? Democracy. The expansion of democracy into the workplace. I mean, this is, the, this is one way of thinking about it, is that Thanks. democracy is a great thing, but it doesn't exist within the workplace. Workplaces are, are dictatorships. 
Yeah. There is someone who's in control, who makes the decisions, and he can You're the smart them. boss. Boss yeah. knows best. Boss knows best, right? And you can have benevolent dictatorships, but the workplace is a is not a democracy. It's a dictatorship. Doesn't that also free people, though? Like, does everyone, like... Exactly what I a don't dictator want a of a country where, would say. If I have a, a nine-to-five <laughs> job where I'm going to work every day, and I'm feeding my family, and I'm doing everything... Mm-hmm. Do I need to to have a say in the general or like the or not, excuse me the specifics of how a company works as a worker? Like, mm-hmm. why not go? I'll let you handle it. Yeah, you can get paid more. You you are you're the boss. You understand. You actually want to do this. You yeah. want to be able to direct the ship in some direction. I have no problem with that. Yeah. So two thoughts on this, and these are just thoughts to throw out. So one is, if Marx's earlier work on alienation is right, which means if there is something inherently alienating about just working eight hours a day to get a pay packet, even if it's a good pay packet, where, but you're not invested in what you're making, you're not involved Here it is. creatively. Now in we're it. getting into the good stuff, yeah. All right. So if, if like, so even you, let's imagine you're getting paid really well, yep. but you're using 60 hours of your week making something that you don't care about. You're okay. an accountant or something, you just don't care about your work. Now you're getting well paid, so you can no, buy a everyone, nice car. It's the paycheck you can't refuse, it's the yes. offer you can't refuse, yeah. yeah. So that's great. But is that, imagine that same person, and let's say they're earning half the amount that they're earning mm-hmm. as an accountant. But they're doing something that they're invested in, that they enjoy creating, that 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 part of their subjectivity is invested in. If that's better, then one has to start thinking, is it is it possible to imagine a society where the majority of our work we can actually invest our creativity, our artistry, our subjectivity in? I mean, imagine all the people, you know. Yeah. Mm. Sounds like a John. You, you mm. sound like you're talking about some some uh, John Lennon uh, hoopla. Uh, what do you got? A what is that? That's my fridge. Coffee I, machine. No, I just got my <laughs> fridge replaced before you arrived because it was broken and the ice is filling up. Just screaming. <laughs> so at it's us. screaming. The ice is filling. Um, no. So okay. Okay. So yeah, this is great. So that's one argument. The other. What was argu- the argument? Oh, no, not argument. Argument for for people being more invested in their work. Uh, and and it, it is an argument for socialism in the sense of saying the workers own the means of production. Yes. So it's not just a fairness of mo- money. It is a psychological... Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's actually a mental health argument. Because by the way, because like. the, yeah, the argument you were making as a hypothetical is the same argument someone might make for a dictatorship. It's like, well, the people do want to, you know, like, you know, they, they need some people who are in charge, who are looking out for them. Um, yes. You know, they don't want to get involved in democracy. And so uh, the, and, oh, we should talk about fascism, actually. Not that I think America For our listeners, fascist, I just held up a picture of Trump and Pete said, let's talk about fascism. N- and that, so, not that I'm making that I don't claim. know. Because yeah, yeah. actually, I don't <laughs> think America is in danger of fascism, but fascism is capitalism You don't think we're in danger of fascism? You can't be in danger of something you're already experiencing. What were you saying? Yeah. Well, you know, and one definition of fascism, or not definition, is fascism often arises, it is, is capitalism in decline. So fa- fascism is when the state comes in and props up private companies, gives money to massive amounts of money to private corporations to keep them going. And that's one of the things that you start to see with the growth of, of fascism is, is the, the government in the service of um, uh, private industry. That's one thing that you st- which should start to make you worry. Yeah, that's scary. Um, but also let's maybe what I'm learning right now is that we should discuss some of these isms Isn't, yes. um, in separate podcasts. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Because there's a lot, Let's do lot to unpack with yeah, fascism. Yeah. Um, but, and there might be more to unpack in a couple months. But um, not that I think that we're living in some fascist dictatorship right now. I, yeah. I think but you're more just, inclined to that than I am. Uh, no. I am more inclined to it, but I don't, I'm not an alarmist by nature. So yeah. I can't help the fact that I, and I was raised Republican and conservative and still don't. Um, I have a tendency in my brain, for better or worse, to kind of mute the uh, this, the the high volume that a lot of the um, news headlines seem to have about Trump and about fascism and about how horrible everything is. Something in my brain just goes, eh, it's not that bad, which is probably my circumstances. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. I, what I, what's led me to, to socialism as a 
something worthy of discussion beyond going socialism leads to communism and therefore everyone will be unhappy. Like the, the argument against it seems to be so diabolically dystopian that I have a hard time believing that as well. Conservatives will go, Oh, socialism is going to lead to communism every time. And it always has, and therefore it always will. Uh, and, but also there's multiple kinds of socialism. There's multiple ways to implement socialism. And also, um, Speaking of capitalism, going back to the capitalism thing, would you agree? I mean, I would certainly say this. It seems like we are in, I feel this in my my body, so I can't articulate it in any kind of academic or smart way. It seems like we've reached late stage capitalism and to deny that seems just like, like saying that it, it, it sounds, it to, to say that we're not in some kind of late stage capitalism right now feels like saying that the earth uh, you know, is the center of the solar system mm. still. It feels, or the earth is flat. It yeah. feels so, and maybe that's not, maybe that's just my own perspective and I can't shake myself from it, but I can't get past this feeling that um, with social media, the internet, the ease at which we can learn anything, the ease at which we can get anything. I did Postmates twice yesterday. I got, I got really good deli food mm. and then ice cream. London and it was, Deli. That's right? in Northern Ireland. Dude, I got matzo anyway. ball soup. It was <laughs> wonderful. It was so delicious. Came to my door, and I'm like, this shouldn't be happening. And a lot no, of that is, no. is monetary, and I have the ability to do it. But also, it's still, even functionally speaking, that means every, people can do it. It's yeah. still a thing you can do. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it seems like a land of excess right now, yes. and it seems like that can only last so long. And I think we're seeing... Well, it is. It is interesting. We're seeing the spur, the yeah. geysers yeah. shoot up. It, it, it's been a while since people have started to think that capitalism might not be the end of history. That is not. That's kind of like people are starting to, like, you know, postulate that that might be the thing in the popular imagination. That is interesting. Yeah. That everyone seems to think that to go. But I still think it's not that much. I think a lot of people who think they're critiquing capitalism are capitalists. That's my major. That's why I'm against liberalism. That's why I'm against neoliberalism. That's why I'm against this. The the kind of le- a lot of the leftism I see because I think it's just it is capitalism. Oh, hundred yeah. percent. But yeah, so I th- I still think Mark Fisher's definitely Mark Fisher came up with the term capitalist realism. I think that's still largely right, but less so. Like I think that some people are literally going there might be an alternative way of doing stuff. Yeah, there's at least yeah. a way of doing stuff. Because I think also, okay, maybe I'm, now we're just getting into full-on discussion now. So we'll get back to maybe explaining. Oh, yeah, because I'll get second. back to those three definitions. I I'm, love that, yeah. Some stage, yeah. But um, it seems like people are realizing with everything that's going on mm-hmm. for the past 10 years, thanks to the internet, with the presidency, and what's going on right now and how everyone's it's the meme it's everyone oh my gosh 2020 is so crazy what a crazy it's a crazy year Mm. that just popped out of nowhere and had absolutely no uh you know it wasn't absolutely a product of a million decisions that happened before it of everything that's going on right now but anyway uh it seems like people are real like the curtain's getting pulled back in basically every area um, it's it. Nietzsche was a big one. Nietzsche pulled back the curtain. Mm-hmm. Darwin pulled back a curtain. Since then, we've gotten the internet. All these other curtains of politics and everything are getting pulled back, and it looks like you know the the emperor is naked a little bit. Mm-hmm. And it seems like people are going, okay, well, if everything else is kind of like made up a little bit, mm-hmm. it would stand to reason that capitalism is also made up. Money is made up, and we could pretty much make up something else. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. was a real long winded yeah. way of getting to a point of. We made all this happen, and therefore, yeah. theoretically, we could choose to change it if we wanted yeah. to. Now, my thing is, and we'll maybe get into this, but is that most of what we're seeing, most of the discontent that we're seeing, is sadly a, an attempt to prop up capitalism on all sides. Like, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a frantic attempt by um, some of the major institutions and organizations, the entertainment industrial complex, the major social media organizations, that, that, and also people on the right. Yeah. There's, a, there's a frantic attempt to... Buy Goodyear tires, going. don't buy Goodyear tires, or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. decided based... It's, you're still buying a product of someone else yeah. who owns the product. And even representation just means I want someone who looks like me to be a billionaire right that's mm-hmm. great but like that doesn't help me if i'm working in wendy's 
uh, yes. you know, so there's a, so you're still making more. Yeah. So representation is a, the ultimate kind of like attempts to put a smiley face on, mm-hmm. on cop. And we disagree here a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. You're more into identity politics I mean, than I am, I mean, yeah, I which is totally okay. But I would argue that Marxism is, and this is where, this is a massive discussion about is Marxism, what's its relationship to identity politics? So that we can go into that. That's a di- but, I mean, I, yeah. let's go into it. I yeah, mean, let's go into it. But here's, here's the, the, the things of like, the, the three things that socialism and capitalism that people think of the difference. One is, um, is that in capitalism, people own the means of production. Or sorry, private individuals own the means of production. Mm-hmm. Private individuals can set up their corporations, right? Whereas in socialism... Which is fun. Very cool. What's that? That's very cool. I know this is where I'm... I, this is where I don't like historical socialism because I'm quite, I think that's a good thing to, well, no, not, I See, think that, we told you this is going to be the yes. best explanation you've ever, yeah. uh, <laughs> well, the alternative in socialism so far has been organizations are owned by the government, right? Uh, elected officials. So the old joke in communist, in communist Russia was, uh, you know, everyone has a Mercedes in Russia uh, and they're driven by the government officials, right? Because the idea is the government officials are the people, but they're the ones who drive the Mercedes. However, that's in in socialist countries. What a hilarious joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Leave but it you to get Russia. get killed for telling it, so I, I, yeah. that's what makes it funny. <laughs> that, is, that part makes it funny, yeah. <laughs> um, you should get killed for saying a joke that unfunny. That unfunny, that's right, yeah. Um, the, uh, so in, in socialism, yeah, government officials run the utilities, run most of the organizations. Secondly, in capitalism, commodities are distributed and produced through the free market. Whereas in socialist countries, traditionally, uh, again, that is planned by government officials, the distribution of yeah. commodities. Those two, I can understand why Americans would go, I would never want socialism, right? It is in our blood. It's in your blood, yeah. It but is the a third one, genetically inherited. Yeah disposition yeah. to hate the government. Yes. But it's you know what clinically the... and scientifically proven and you yeah. are wrong if you tell me otherwise. If you yeah. are an American, even if you're an American who thinks that socialism is cool, I think socialism oh, is yeah. a great idea that should be explored. Giving the government power all of that power to decide everything, <laughs> F <laughs> off. Yes. No way. Yeah. No, I love that about America. I think it's great. But you know the third one is very American. I think um, you Americans are going to love this. And I say I you wait. Americans, I am now living in America. Maybe yeah, but Americans change your are. accent and then yeah. we'll talk. You need to do the real yeah. stuff that matters. I don't care about your legal status. You need to talk yeah. like us. Yes, but I think Americans are going to love this. This is very American. Because Americans, what, one of the many things I love about America is this real independence and freedom and responsibility and all of that. So the third, which we've already kind of talked about a little bit, is the idea that of, of extending democracy needs to be extended into the workplace. That doesn't mean workers get to have to choose everything, but you might vote on someone who represents you and everybody in the, the organization gets a share in the surplus value that's created by the organization. Are you talking about unions? Uh, co-ops, more. Unions are, are a kind of like transitionary force, but unions mm-hmm. can be good and bad, but more cooperatives. Yeah. Yeah. I watch a lot of mafia movies. Oh, Un- yeah, unions, yeah. it turns out. I'm no historian, but I've seen enough Godfather. Yeah. But the cooperative is, and I've got a friend who runs a really great cooperative in Belfast, but a cooperative is more that, you know, everybody who works gets a share of what's created in the company. You, you're all invested in the company to a greater or lesser extent. It's not equally distributed. I mean, the CEO gets a lot more money, et cetera, et cetera, but, but not infinitely more money. And it's, it's something where you're represented and the, basically it's just democracy extended now into the workplace. I think it's a very American ideal. Yeah, I you, love that. Yeah. The, you it know what the main really critique cool. is? I mean, I feel like we, we kind of done that with the Valley folk uh, in our own symbolic way at least yeah. um but uh because because it felt weird to have uh to speak candidly it felt weird to truly in my opinion have someone who was a prodigy working for us who was uh while we can't afford to give we've taken pay cuts to give raises and we've done all that we've literally gone we'll have less money so you can have more money yeah but also that's knowing and having a sentimental attachment to our one employee you extrapolate that, you got 300 employees. 
I don't care if 150 of them are geniuses. If I don't know them, I'm not going to be doing any of that. I'm going to be off on my yacht, like, yeah, doing yeah. cocaine, yeah, with my Dan Bilzerian, you know, yeah. models. And that's like five years from now that yeah. I get to do that. Yeah, if we which I think is alienating to Dan Bilzerian as well. That this is the issue. Because what do you, you mean alienating to Dan Bilzerian? Well, here's the thing. So, right, the people I know in Belfast. <laughs> are you defending Dan Bilzerian? No, no, I'm going again. I'm saying that he's alienated. I'm saying that he probably isn't as happy as he looks. Oh, a hundred percent. What, yeah. dude? I would lay my life down on a bet that I am happier oh, yeah. every moment of the day than Dan Bilzerian yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. But that's also yes. just yeah, yeah, my own uh, hubris. But anyway, so, <laughs> so uh, well, because yeah, here's right, because here's the main objection. Well, on on that right, somebody will say that well, if I have a company and I make, you know, it's a little bit of a benevolent dictatorship. I make the money, I'll be happier, but. Potentially, you, you're not. Potentially, being part of an organization where you're all in it together, you're all involved in a local community, you may not make as much money. You'll still make good money, but you might not make as much money. But it actually also might make you feel more social, more connected to other people, less privatized. Because what happens with money, and I lived in one of the wealthiest places in America for four years, and I noticed that, that people are so privatized, the more money you have, the more separation you have, both physically, as in you've got more, more walls. physical space, more walls, and also psychologically, there's more distance. That actually, Those people don't understand me, yeah. Yeah, but that, that so that, that potentially cooperatives are not just beneficial to the people who work in them, they're beneficial to the people who set them up. So, yeah, because we're getting into some interesting territory okay. right now. And okay. I'm going to throw some stuff at you. Please, fire ahead. It's just, this is like socialism coleslaw. Mm. It's a bunch of stuff thrown in, and we're going to maybe find... Maybe if there's something you can take away from this, if you're listening or watching, then great. But, I mean, who knows? Uh, you, uh, we, ha we have a situation right now in America where people, when they hear socialism, or they hear socialized health care, socialized mm. X, Y, and Z... There's this knee-jerk reaction to be like, you didn't work for it, yeah. so you don't deserve it. Yeah. Uh, you don't deserve a higher minimum wage. You don't deserve this. You don't deserve... What's that all about? Yeah. Why is it that we have enough resources to go around? We have enough houses to put homeless people in. We have, we have the ability to make everyone okay, at least. Yeah. And yet we don't even attempt any of it. Yeah. We're good with how things are. As I as I scream about socialism, I won't give money to the poor to the homeless person as I'm getting on the highway. Sometimes, well, I, I, sometimes I, mean, I do. I'm not rarely. Against, this is most where times I'm I'm, much, I'm more conservative than you. You definitely like, but that's where I'm like I totally agree with that sentiment. That the sentiment of like you know you we, have to do something. We have to contribute to society. That in fact, that this is one of the reasons why I think tax is important. So he, for Hegel, the main the main purpose of tax. It's not so much, you know, you're paying for stuff, of course you're paying for stuff, but it actually, it involves you in society. You're literally giving your money to, to things like, uh, you know, uh, streets and schools and hospitals, whatever. So I'm a big fan of going like, no, we, we do need to be invested and work and be part of the social body and find creative ways to work within it. Absolutely, I'm going like, I don't like this whole kind of stupid luxury communism thing where but it's like where people this fantasy of of some sort of automated <sighs> world in which there's no opposition yeah you know um we're all just laying yeah. out and everything is eat, feeding us and we're all happy i mean it's that terrible. would be the most unhappy that's hell there's hell i mean simone Weil has a great essay on that called on a theory of i forget what it's called but uh it's i was just reading it today actually but um on the theory of utopia or something or the perfect society but you, you need to have to give yourself to a society. You need a person mm. needs a purpose, right? Yeah, purpose. Like you have, yeah. which I think here's what I get real interested in because, and I think you'll have something to say on this. The argument I, I hear a lot from the right, uh, and at least from like the intellectual dark web and all this stuff, is um, it's all job oriented. It's all like you work, you have to work, and all this stuff. But this there's a weird philosophical slash spiritual thing involved in these types of conversations where I do feel like any political stance you take 
ultimately comes down to what your philosophy is on life. So if your yeah. philosophy on life is just that everyone should be happy and it's decadence all the time and like it's mm -hmm. all about pleasure, then you might be more of a socialist that just wants everybody to be happy and er feed everybody. Yes, which isn't socialism. That's what annoys me so much about people who use the word socialist. Like, right, well, but yeah. I'm right and you're yeah. wrong. So no, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you there are people who are like yeah. that, yeah. Uh, who are maybe misguided or whatever. But like, if you want human beings to experience the fullness of being human, which involves sacrifice, involves work, it involves uh, you being above and below others all the time because mm, you're yeah. around. It's we're a species of of, of relativity. We we're constantly interconnected. Um, like, what would be the best system for human beings on both a spiritual philosophical level and an economic yeah. level and i think we could do that theoretically yes. and i think socialism is involved with it and it bums me out that it's become this like red herring or, or yeah. whatever the term is where it's just like a and you might want to the word it, yeah. is so symbolic now yes. that's like well how do we get back to talking about people being fulfilled in their work where yeah. they work yeah i mean i i have no problems getting rid of the work right socialism literally just meant the transitionary phase between capitalism and communism these words are now all invested. I but mean, that could not be a more yes. uh, anti-socialism yeah. sentiment. <laughs> so, the, but but like this is where, and this is where our, I guess I say people who both are for and against socialism at the moment. I don't think I've ever read socialism, but it, you could you could replace it with just democracy. All we're talking about is how there is a work that you could almost define human society as the as the pushing of democracy into more and more areas of reality. And all we're talking about is um, what would it look like to have democracy in the workplace? Now, the main argument against it, and this is where my work comes in, right? The main argument against it is a brilliant argument, which is simply... We'll, we'll fire you. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Well, no, it's simply you can do it, right? It's simply there's nothing about the current system that prevents co cooperatives. And there are some, and there are some very successful ones, but... There's nothing to stop it. If it's really a better way of living, if it's really better for the workers, if it's really better for the people who set the companies up, then why are there so few, mm -hmm. right? And that is a, that's, the, that's the main argument that a, 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 a capitalist will make. And it's a very good argument. It has to be taken. Like, they're saying nothing is stopping you. We're not. Yeah, we're not. Push back. Just go and do it. So it would actually probably, many employers slash capitalists, would probably love to have such a vivid uh, communication from their employees. So yeah. just like, this is what you want? Okay, cool. We're all working together. We're all in this. And so the place in Belfast is called Boundary. It's a brewery, right? So, and they're kind of a cooperative. They're in this really cool area. People in the community all bought shares. They get cheap beer. They, they're com contributing to the community. They make the best beer in the UK, pretty much. They, um, they're, they're, they're all working to create something that is not just making money, but creating community, developing group. Who, who wouldn't want to be involved in something like that? Yeah. But the, and then they go, so just go and do it. And this comes to the real hub of the issue, which is I would argue that the reason why more people aren't making cooperatives and is because we're libidinally invested in a type of frenetic pursuit of more and more and more. Even the workers. Well, yes, we're all caught up in it, workers. And, and especially owners. the employers. Yes. And so what we need is we need a, a, a network of deserts in the oasis, these communities that libidinally unplug us from this, this way of desiring and therefore we can be in the world differently. And that's where my work comes you in. You know, there is the be in the world but not of it kind of yeah. uh, Jesus mo motif or whatever you would call it that is uh, really beautiful. <clears throat> and also, I think it speaks directly to the criticisms that a lot of people on the right have of going, oh, so you're a socialist, but you get to have a beautiful view of Los Angeles and a sky, you get to have all, uh, you, oh, you, you get to drive a nice car and you have all these things. But if you're a socialist, mm. shouldn't you be making sure that everyone, and it's like, no man, like that's not what this is about. Yeah, it is a societal, like that argument is so yeah. tired to me yeah. that I, I don't, I yeah. can't take it seriously. We are like, Oh, you're going to talk about socialism, but you yourself ha own an iPhone and yeah. your iPhone is made by slaves. And you're like, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it is. Yeah. 
And there's a lot of, I mean, one of the things, and I don't do this, none of us can do this exclusively, but so the paintings behind you, for example, one of the reasons why I like to buy art and not um, kind of like Ikea art is because, so John McCormick, who's an artist from Northern Ireland, did those. I know he's invested in that. He, he didn't just make those for money. He was, it, 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 he got value Something from, of him is in that. Is in that. And then I paid him for his work. And, and, and whenever I buy like alcohol, sometimes I like to buy like, you know, small bash distillery gin where I'm going like, at least I think the people are proud of what they're making. You know, they're, they're kind of like, they're taking pride and they're, they're, they're not alienated. Even if it's still, you know, workers and mean, owners of means of production, I'm going like, this is not about being poor or anything like that. It's about, can we imagine a society where, and it's, it's what we do. I mean, we're very lucky where we work at doing something that also we don't feel alienated from. That like when in my work, I feel like not only am I financially compensated, but I enjoy it and it's part of my creativity and my life. And I'm going like, how can more It's actually and part of people, your identity. It's part of my identity. It's part of, yes, your what you create is part of your being. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're cooking you know, if you're a chef and you're cooking a meal that is like not just a McDonald's burger but you're cooking something you're proud of that you're giving to your friends or strangers and they're going, this is incredible. Can we imagine a society where, where we are able in our work time to find meaning and not just in our spare time? I, just, I came up with a business idea. Yeah. I'm gonna create uh, Uber 2 and it's gonna be, so Uber and Lyft and everything. So automation is a big thing, right? It's mm -hmm. coming. Uh, we, again, disagree a little bit on this. I think you're a little bit uh, you're less worried, I would say, about the onslaught of automation than most people would be. Like, because automation, if you are a fan of maybe like the Andrew Yang kind of school of thought, universal basic income is is which universal basic income. Even he is basically like this is a, a transitionary yeah. program to whatever is up next. Uh, which I'm so bummed, man. That like, why I could have been born like. I wish all my friends and me had been born like 40 years earlier when we really could have hit the heyday of this. But I do feel like we're on the, we're, we're going to have a neck, uh, tough time in the next 15 years. But, um, the, uh, my idea is Uber two is you go, okay, so Uber is going to become automated, mm -hmm. right? Uber two is going to be individual coaches, right? Uh -huh. Wagons. Wagons. Like, I'm like it already. Yeah. Not unlike wagon. Maybe yeah. a 1940s Ford T something picks uh -huh. you up. And that's going to be my business model. Because when the Ubers and the Lyfts and everything goes to just robot cars, mm -hmm. how about a little guy who pops up in a, an, a, an old F Ford whatever who he's restored himself. It's his car. Uh, yeah. You have to own the car. Your car. You built it up. It's from 1950 before, 1980 before, whatever. Who cares? Yeah. Well, that's what we talked about, the hipster. The definition of hipster exactly. is making things more Give difficult. Give me something yeah. that a human being is connected yeah. to is basically the hipster movement. I said that to two of my friends who were who are very successful capitalists. And I said, there's always money to be made by making things more difficult. And they said, yes, that's, that is how you make hundreds of dollars. Oh, damn. Damn, yeah. got you. That is how you remain poor, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Damn, I thought I said something <laughs> profound. But they shot it down. Bam. Yeah, my yeah. friends were outquipped me yeah um so yeah where were we talking about social oh yeah where are we at with socialism so, oh yeah so i have i don't I, i'm gonna be honest with you i still have no idea what it is right well what do you think of the, this idea uh, the, richard wolf is one of the main uh advocates of this at the moment but of this idea of democracy gradually extended into the workplace i like i like that but in the meantime why can't we just give people like some health care? Mm. Why is that that big of a deal? Yeah. Why is that like a some? I, I that makes no sense to me. You know, here. So I have a story. I stayed one time in Minnesota. Oh no! Where are you going with this? You're gonna be some anecdotal bullshit. It's gonna well, no, I, debunk so, the idea of socialized health care because no, all no, the doctors no. are gonna not be paid anything. And they're not gonna kill. <laughs> they're not gonna care to save your life, and you're gonna die. Yeah. Well, no, I'm from Europe. I'm a big, Euro, uh, you know, universal health care guy. Um, I and you're like, unhealthy. <laughs> no, so, and I, yes, exactly. And I need it. You're uh, I don't have any health insurance. I don't know how to do that in America. I've been here eight years. Don't have any health insurance. Yeah. What, do, what do you do? I mean, I, I, I honestly looked into I it know. once and couldn't figure it out. 
I have a PhD in philosophy. I couldn't figure it out. I honestly, <laughs> this is my theory. The system is so screwed up that I think if you don't have health insurance, if you're just like, it's Anthem. Yeah. And if you just say the name, I think they'll be like, okay, and they'll give you whatever. Oh, they'll you give need. whatever. Later, I, you'll get hit with a bell. All right. Because I did buy something, right? I eventually bought something, and then I found out eight months later that I'd bought a top up. So I didn't buy the insurance, I bought a top up insurance. That yeah, meant you bought that, supplementary insurance. Yes. You told me about this. This is so funny to me. So I think for eight you months. You bought insurance for like <laughs> staying at home and not being able. You bought basically paychecks. Is that right? That's I mean, I think you bought direct money to you to supplement your income if you're ever injured, but you did not buy the I didn't insurance buy that pays for yeah. you to survive the injury. Exactly. <laughs> not, not at all. I was like, fuck. What am I doing? No Very idea. Funny. So, but I was in Minnesota and we were speaking at a gig. Me, me and two friends from Ireland we were doing a tour, and we stayed at the guest house of someone who was the CEO of a pharmaceutical company. And now I've seen money. You know, I lived in Greenwich, Connecticut. I've seen money. I have never seen money like this house that this guy lived in. Um, it had and the height, the car he had was a custom made car. He had these sculptures that were by, I can't remember the artist, but like these were serious. The, the wealth was incredible. And I'd never seen anything like it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of money. The problem is... Can I tell you a story? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, please. Can I tell you the most wealth I've ever seen? Uh-huh. So I, um, wonderful human being, uh, he, he's doing the coolest stuff in the world. But oh yeah, I know the guy. Gentleman, mean, yeah. he's a gentleman. And he's, uh, at one point, was set to inherit more money than any living person on the planet. Wow. That's a lot of money, in fairness. Won't go into it too much. Wonderful guy. Mm -hmm. Truly cool dude. Uh, I went to dinner with him. It was in Las Vegas. He hated Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Las Vegas is what poor people think wealth is like, and exactly. I include myself as poor in that sense. He's like this like, is like I remember, I, uh, you know, oh, absolutely. Was there once, and she was like, "This is like, this is this is what people who aren't rich think rich looks like." Oh no, I go there. <laughs> That's I, why I love it. Yeah, I go to Vegas so I can dress up and pretend yeah. to be. I'm an. Yeah. I go to Vegas. I to want be an gold asshole. lions uh, <laughs> on the end of my bed because that's what rich people do, isn't exactly, it? Exactly. Yes. Gold. Lions. gold. <laughs> Everything is be gold. 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 Uh, champion at breakfast they, so i'm like doing my i'm in this restaurant i've never been in a restaurant like this and it's in a private room of the restaurant and then the reservations were made like yeah, people I got don't know escorted. that all There's, restaurants have a private room for billionaires yes very even crazy. mcdonald's i yeah. got a dessert dude that was like it was not asked for it was not ordered and it was uh created specially from the chef that was aware of yeah. the guests and I got a chef made essentially Snickers bar uh, and I don't know how to describe this exactly but it was I, I was like this is absurdly luxurious mm -hmm. and it was like and gold flakes and oh, like yeah. that kind of stuff and mm -hmm. like but it was at the end of the day it was a candy bar it was a I know yeah. but I was like Blah, 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 blah. Thank you so much. I'm a pig. Blah, blah, blah. Trash. Blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, I tried. I was young and sweet, and I tried really hard to be like, huh, can I offer to pay for some of the bill? Uh, <laughs> like, which is such an absurd gesture to make, but I felt like I had to say, he's like, next time. I hear, I he did, did that the, He did the classiest thing. It was next time. I did that once and got caught out for it twice. So when I lived Because they, they knew that you're like, you're doing the thing where you're... Well, no, I, I just, I, I insisted too much. So, well, it happened twice. Once I insisted too much and I was expecting them to insist back and then I ended up and it was... You did the Irish thing of like three times, right? Which we learned yeah, the shortly Irish thing after. Three times yeah. and, and they refused twice. They didn't refuse the third time and I got hit with a, like, oh, it was like six or seven. You can't go three bill. times, man. Yeah. You go twice. And then I, there's a, there's a guy I know who's a, he's a billionaire and I, and I, I don't know him well now, but I knew him at the time when I was in Connecticut. And we went out for a meal, and he lit and I said I'll pay. He said no, no, and he'd forgotten his credit card, and um, I had to pay for that, and Yikes. that was expensive. Yeah, yeah absolutely, no problem. <laughs> so, I'm just like you. Yeah, so I'll be paying this off for a long time. Yeah, that was painful. Uh, uh, yeah, that's why I don't go too socialist because I'm like I always want there to be people who 
have a lot of money. Yeah. I think it's cool. I don't know. There's like a cool, like, I don't want to ever be as equally cool as anybody. Why would I want to be as equally rich as everybody? Here's the funny thing. I want there thing, to be cooler right? people. I want there to be Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo DiCaprio is the is a billionaire in terms of coolness. And I want there yeah. to be cool people out there that I can go, he's the cool guy. Yeah, there is this. So I have a friend, right? I have a friend who made a lot of money in San Francisco. He was very, I, we used to do underage, underage is the wrong word. Yeah, uh, under 18, Yeah, under 18 nightclubs, right? So I would do visuals. I had this, I would do would visuals. That, I mean, for, were you under 18 at the time? I was, I was, I was around 18, but we were, it's for kids who Great. didn't want to drink alcohol. Clarify that. Yeah. Yeah, this shit. Um, so it was like this in this place called. It was about Boom four Boom years Room. ago. There was an under yeah. eighteen nightclub I went to. <laughs> that I just hung right up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, social. Yeah. But so he, he ran these um, these kind of like under eighteen nightclubs. They were actually Christian. Well, they weren't overtly, but it was for kids who wanted to. Just, you know, oh yeah, like a youth group, youth group kind of thing. But he then made a lot of money in San Francisco. Early investor in Uber, and then he eventually came back to Belfast. And it was funny because he, like when you live in San Francisco, there's no, there's no upper limit. No matter how much money you've got, there's always more you can buy. There's always more. And he came back to Northern Ireland and we were talking and he says like, there's not really much you can do with a lot of money. Like basically he bought a house that was like the best house you could imagine. He, they got it built, they did it all. And it was like, you know, 300,000 or something like that. And it was like, and he was driving a Maserati. Three hundred thousand dollars pounds. Yeah, so about three and a three. Yeah, like four hundred thousand dollars maybe yeah, to, for this incredible, brand new, built from scratch house, right? Yeah. In this beautiful, like uh, you know, countryside, and. He was driving a Maserati and said, I feel like a twat, right? Uh, I have yeah. to get rid of it. Yeah, you can't so, do that in Northern Ireland. So that's the thing is, and I, I brought some friends who have money to Belfast, and I said, well, if you've got money, this is not like a great place to live. Like, there's not much you can do. But the disparity is less. And I go like, so which is better, right? In a society where you, you, could, have, you could have, you know, a billion and still feel that you can't have everything you want, or a society where you can still be loaded, but if you've got like a few million, you're pretty set. that you're set, like there's that you've kind of reached your limit. What's and it, maybe neither's better or, or whatever, but which it's would also, you prefer living? Well, I mean, it, uh, would you want to be at the limit? I wouldn't want to be at the limit. You see that, and that's the libidinal. That that's my work. My mm -hmm. work is how do we free people from the the thing where there's always more. Are you saying I'm the problem? Yeah. <laughs> I finally we've got there. 78 episodes Hold of the on. fundamentalists and thank God we've got there. I've been there. talking about everybody else. Yeah. But maybe I'm the problem. You yeah. Know what, can I tell can I say something publicly which is that you and I I can't say too much but would like to potentially have a community in Los Angeles that was helping people some uh, people. Yeah, some people experience the kind of thing we're talking about here. See, like my yes. definition of church is not to fine. do that. You can speak freely. Oh, can I? All right. So we have been talking about setting up a community in Los yes. Angeles, the, the Fundamentalist the Church fundamentalist of Los Angeles. Church of Los Angeles. La, yeah. Los Angeles. <laughs> and I love that. we've been back and forth on it. And my main thing, see what you think of this, right? My main hesitation, like not hesitation, but... I think that the main role of the fundamentalist Church of Los Angeles is to help unplug, libidinally unplug people from the frenetic pursuit of something that will make them whole and complete. Yeah, my goal is something that's probably similar, but we'll sounds like something that people like. can understand. <laughs> uh, there's something there. I mean, yeah, a community, I think, is very important right now. Yeah. And that's kind of what we've been talking about, I think, is creating a, an in-person kind of thing. Because also it's like, um, you know, we talk about pursuit. And we talk about, like, uh, you work hard and you create this empire or whatever. I think what we offer with this podcast is very valuable. I think we ourselves by doing this would be freeing ourselves from the idea that the podcast needs to be this massive thing. I think if it can be highly effective to I a think smaller our new, group of our people. listenership is what frees us from thinking this is going to be massive. <laughs> Man, you know, I've been, I've been going through a whole Ooh. existential thing with fame and success and all that stuff. It's oh. been very interesting. So we should, that's a separate okay. podcast. Oh, okay. well, I'll you're, talk about it. You were giving podcast. me a teaser there. No, no, yeah. but I, yeah. I mean, I'm just very like, 
I'm so turned off by the I truly turned off by the idea of like big big success right now. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm talking about. I with, don't know with why so, with with capitalism socialism is it so the book Capitalism and Desire, which we've both read, is really an argument for saying that forget about all the economic stuff is that we are very tempted to always think that we need more whether it's more listeners or more viewers on one's youtube channel or more money or more houses or more a bigger house or like there is this thing within us that thinks if only we got x everything would be great and what if that is not the solution to the problem but that is the problem that we need a solution to yeah i mean i think you're right you are right like you're that's a hundred percent yeah. Correct. But it I sounds like that's how you're. That's how you feel. You're like, yeah, I, I don't want to be in this, this pursuit of like. I don't, but I, I do think that the moment I free myself from that, I will become successful. Mm. So I, yeah, I, that I, is I can't, the, so I'm still the paradox tied to of it. grace. Yeah, yeah, the paradox of grace is the moment you don't feel you have to do anything, the more you can do stuff. I always though have felt like my, when I am my most authentic and most libidinally invested in what we're doing that uh it is it gets a little esoteric it gets a little i mean anyone still listening to this can probably <laughs> see this firsthand <laughs> it gets very in the weeds with stuff and mm. that is just not conducive to being big. a big public appeal like i'm not i'm not standing on a soapbox going i'm a socialist i'm going yeah social sounds great we should really talk about this um so I don't know what my there's a purposelessness in what I'm doing now, but yeah. there is a, a total satisfaction also in this, and then in uh, the classes and that I'm taking and all that stuff. Like all that is pointing to something, but I'm excited yeah. to see what it is. And that's yeah. a separate conversation yeah. slash podcast. But yeah, um, to get back to socialism though, yes, what would you say mm -hmm. to someone, mm -hmm. Pete, hypothetically speaking? Yeah, someone goes. Socialism means that they're going to take all your hard-earned money. They're going to give it to people who are lazy and don't give a crap. Yeah. What would you say to them? Well, I'd say you're you, you're right you're to right. resist that. You're I mean, it. to any system that would do that, you mm -hmm. you fight to the death. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. Do where we gonna... have a in politics? Do we have a responsibility to care about other people? Why not use politics to, to make myself richer? Who cares about other people? If I'm richer and they want to be richer, won't it work out in the end? Oh, yeah. So if, if I'm richer and they want to be richer, they'll, yeah. they'll figure it out in a capitalist system. Well, see, well, okay, here's, a, here's an interesting thing. So Ayn Rand is an, you know, one of the major uh, advocates of that position, which is kind of an, it, like Ayn Rand's position is right, we're all self-interested. But, you know, we all pursue our self-interest, utilitarians, and, you know, we can create a system where that benefits everybody, right? Yeah. So, yeah. You want it, go get it. Yeah. So the Freudian response to that is simply that, funnily enough, although it looks like capitalists are very selfish, and a lot of people say, oh, you know, you're selfish, you want yourself it is, actually, capitalists are more like perverted, selfless individuals. They will often, and we will, I'll put myself in this, We'll pursue things even when it damages us. There it is. Yeah. You know, more and more. So it damages our relationships. It gives us heart disease. The doctor says, right, you're going to, if you don't stop, you've got, you've got 200 million and you want 300 million. Just stop and enjoy it because you're going to give yourself a heart attack. You step over your friends. You damage yourself. You damage other people. And you're doing it while knowing it that actually this pursuit of more is not selfish. It's more like a zombie. It's like a, it's like a profound, so, cause a zombie will attack you even if it's gonna die, right? If you have a shotgun, the zombie will still attack you. So it's a perverse type of selflessness. And so what, I'm, what I would argue with the psychoanalytic insight is that this idea of I wanna make as much as I can or whatever is not beneficial even to you. You will end up alienating yourself through that pursuit yeah i think you're right uh and that's the end point i think that's mm. the the big takeaway um the fact that capitalists themselves are suffering and i think are uh lacking and continuously yeah. searching for something like even the a, winners it's a, lose yeah. yeah exactly the losers lose doubly but even the winners lose right that's where i get really um 
with my more liberal friends when they they chalk up CEOs and business owners and all these things to these like evil fat cats. Uh, I'm like, you're not you're not seeing the emptiness that they're also experiencing that is driving some kind of maniacal. It's a little gluttonous, I guess, but also it's they're vic- they're victims i think a little bit of a system where that they it's a game it's a dog that catches the car basically yeah. where you're like oh, okay i did it i've seen this happen i was raised by business owners and republicans and was also and am a business owner who enjoys many republicans company uh, if not their their politics but i've never seen my my folks and specifically my dad a business owner go okay that's enough i've always heard them go we need to do this now now we're going to yeah. do this now we have this house now we're gonna do this when this happens then we can retire when this happens then we can sell the business when a republican is a president and then then we've got this money then maybe we can let it all go and i'm like oh no you're you need this you created a system where you're in they it but it seems like slavery it's and and, yeah it's not republican or it's like the nature of human beings 100 percent not republican or democrat it is a but it does feel weirdly like i'm like do you not see that you seem still really yeah. tied to this in a way that you, you've you earned your way out of it, monetarily speaking, yeah. and yet yeah. they more and more and more. more, and more. Yeah, because you don't see this in the animal kingdom. You really don't. You see whenever an animal is eaten enough, they're it satisfied. Walks away. Whenever they've got shelter, they're happy. Dry, and that's what the difference between instinct and drive for Freud is drive cannot be sated. There's something unnatural about human beings, and there's something unnatural about... Uh, so our socioeconomic right. system. A squirrel doesn't. You don't see. Yeah. You don't see um, a squirrel eating cake and just gouging itself after and just yeah. bah, and then waddling off. Yeah, this is a very. But they still eat whenever they want. Yeah. Oh yeah. So it's it, it's the difference between instinct and drive, and we are we are uh, enthralled to drive, which basically means more and more and more, and not getting what we want. And it's how do we find freedom from that? And until we find freedom from that, I think cooperatives will not thrive so my work is to say how do we create and this is for another podcast but tens of hundreds of thousands of communities across america that meet maybe once a week and engage in a certain ritualistic activity that helps you not be free to pursue what will make you happy but make you free from the pursuit of what will make you happy freedom from this frenetic drive And if we can have those communities where people are libidinally disinvested from this frenetic pursuit, then they will feel more able to create forms of creation and forms of innovation Mm -hmm. that are also uh, not alienating. And when you create this network of groups that can do this, then you'll be happy. Then I'll be happy. You get it. You get the joke. Yeah, I love that. That's where we end. And that's, that's it. Good. That's, that's the end of the podcast. Bye, yeah. everybody. And that's socialism. Thank you. <laughs>